So let's move on to how we boot Lupulus. How do we load software onto the SOC? Well, we have a software tool chain. We start with programs in a high-level language, C. Then we compile the programs into the instruction set architecture, such as RISC-V. So the compilation provides us, you know, a set of instructions in the ISA language. We take bare metal libraries for common operations. So we have things like printf or getS. We want to have libraries that provide them. And since we're not going to be using an operating system, we'll use what we call bare metal libraries. We have all kinds of configuration things like IRQs and boot code that are needed to configure the SOC. So there are another type of a library that we add. We provide a linker script that actually tells us where to direct the binaries to the instruction and data memory, and that provides our executable binary. And then we press the reset button. What actually happens then? Well, a small number of hard-coded RTL instructions are run. They load boot code, a bootloader, from an external source, and the boot code loads the binaries to instruction and data memory. Then the processor can jump to the first address in the program, which is where the main is in our C program. So how do we configure this boot sequence? Well, just we have to remember what the state of a system is. And the state of a system is basically the collection of all the registers that we have and all the memory, the SRAM that we have, and the few inputs that we have. So those three things together, they make up the state of the system and also the outputs that they provide uh, um, straight to the output of the, of the machine. Where do the inputs come from? They come from the board, okay? So we have the board and the inputs are connected to pads over here, which uh, are the inputs to our design. Every flip-flop on our chip gets a reset value. So when we start up, um, we provide a reset signal and the registers get a certain state and that provides us with our initial state of our, of our design. And the memory actually at the beginning is just garbage. We don't know what it is, so we can't rely on it at our reset state. How, how can we configure things? Well, we have these switches that are called bootstraps. The chip will have several inputs that can have startup values. So we have inputs to the chip. We know that they need to be provided with something. We're not allowed to have floating input when we use uh, CMOS type things. So we have to have some sort of levels. So we can use these levels in order to give different configurations to the chip. We can connect them to either you know, uh, power or ground, um, what we call uh, you know, a pull up or a pull down on the board. Okay, we can also have these types of switches or jumpers that can uh, connect them, you know, configurably to VDD or to ground to set, uh, to set different uh, states at the input that then we can use for uh, configuring our chip at boot. So let's see what these PCB bootstraps look like on a real board. So this is the Sansa board, the board that we've been using for our Sansa chip, for Bianca, for Lupulus. So this is the board. And if we go and we look at these two little black things over here, they're switches, they're pairs of four switches. And um, we can see that this is what they kind of look like on a, an illustrative schematic over here. SW3 and SW4, we find their um, electrical schematic in the documentation. And we see that these are SW3 and SW4. They're these pairs of four switches. And what do these uh, switches do? So these are pull down switches. When we close the switch, we uh, make it connect, it is connected to ground. So it causes this line to be um, connected. Okay, and that will give a zero. That's a pull down that goes then over to the actual chip itself from one of these signals. We also have these pull up resistors. So these little things, um, they're resistors. And so these are pull up resistors. So what we have here is we either connect to ground or if we leave an open circuit over here, then we have this very large resistor, 100 kilo ohm resistor, that's going to pull up to VDD over here to uh, 1.8 volts in this case. These all go, as I said, to the chip. So they're initially going to be at zero or at one. And then we can also override them because like these are very, very large uh, resistors. So we can drive something else without causing a, a real contention. So let's now go back to our reset operation. We have what we call a reset sequence. So here's our board and our chip, and we have our inputs that are either pulled up or pulled down. When we hit reset, the registers go to a default value, which will bring them to, you know, whatever the, the, the initial state of the machine is. Some of the registers will sample the pull up or pull down values from the board. So we can actually bring them to a different reset value than what we had in the RTL as their reset, uh, as their reset signal. And these, these things can be configured through the bootstrap. So we can either um, change these through, you know, either putting a resistor here on the board or changing a switch or changing a jumper or something like that. 
One of the registers over here is the reset vector. And the reset vector tells us which is the address of the program that we should run. And this can be mapped to something external, like if we have some sort of a flash disk or something like that, uh, or a boot ROM, we can put in the reset vector the memory map of one of the addresses here, and we can actually go and have our CPU read from those addresses instead of reading from um, the tightly coupled instruction memory. What the bootloader usually does is it has a lot more area than we have on, on our chip or on our um, like hard-coded instructions. So it's going to be some sort of loop that's just going to copy over um, instructions into the memory. It's going to initialize the memory with whatever we had there in our executable, our binary. And then what we can do is we can jump to the instruction memory, which is going to be in these RAMs, and start running these programs that we just copied over. So what actually happens in our particular um, situation in Pulpenix? Well, the, the boot is probably the single most dangerous part of your chip design. Udi, the guy who really develops the whole Pulpenix in Hamsa DI, he has this analogy, which he calls the drawer analogy. It's like trying to slam a drawer shut, but try to throw something into it before it closes. And the thing is that you don't have your actual machine configured. You don't have it working, but you want to configure it in time and maybe start working with something that's not actually there. It's really a crazy thing to do. And so it's really dangerous. And if it doesn't work, your whole chip is dead on arrival. So therefore, we're always going to provide several alternatives. And on Pulpenix, we have several methods for booting. The kind of regular way is using the MMS. SPI. That's a spy um, type interface that is memory mapped. So what that means is that we can have a flash, um, a flash chip that's connected to the uh, to the board, and it's memory mapped, so we can go and start reading out instructions right from the flash. We can use JTAG. So JTAG, um, as maybe you know, is this type of a protocol for testing and so forth. And it, you can really use something like the Open OCD standard to go in and uh, write things into your memory and configure the chip. So that's another way to do it. But the way that we usually do it is using what we call Smart UART with PyShell. So there's this backdoor into the SOC that uses the, the real simple UART type of interface. And then we can use this Python uh, interactive interface on our, on our PC that we can really um, tell the chip what to do. So let's discuss that. What is Smart UART? So just as a reminder, UART is a very simple two-wire um, transfer and receive type of serial interface. So we have um, two types of devices and they, uh, one of them transfers to the other this way, the other one transfers to the other that way. It's really a serial interface, one bit. So Pulpenix has a UART slave port. So if we look again at our type of a uh, picture over here, we have the UART over here, and you can see that the arrow pointing down means that it is a slave. It's just a slave on um, this system. And what that means is that the CPU, or if there was another master over here, it could um, initiate transactions. It could write and read from the UART, but not the opposite way. So, for example, when we write BM printf, which is our bare metal printf command, what we're going to do is we're going to send commands from the um, from the core to the uh, AXI. It's going to go through the bridge here to the APB, go to the UART, store these characters that we sent over on a FIFA uh, on a FIFA on a first in first out buffer, and uh, then the UART controller is going to go and it's going to push them out into our PC or whatever is connected over here. So this is, does not help us with debugging, uh, and we wanted to provide a way to debug over here. And that's where Smart UART comes in. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to add a master port from the UART over to the AXI. So in this case, the UART itself can uh, initiate transactions. So that means that if we memory map all of the locations on the chip, we can actually go with our host PC that's going to be connected over here at the end of the smart UART and start and write things into the instruction memory and data memory and do whatever we want basically with the chip through this simple UART port. So how does smart UART work? Well, we have our host PC over here. We have a USB-C connection to the board. There is a chip called an FTDI, which translates USB-C into a bunch of signals. One of them is UART. So it's an easy way that we can use just this Python library that can talk to the FTDI chip and um, provide a UART communication with our UART controller over here on the chip. So what happens when we reset? Pulpenix is by default usually mapped to the MMSPI, so it tries to go and read off of the flash, but we haven't put anything on the flash disk. So then the host PC actually sends a signal to the chip that stops the CPU. So it 
releases the bus and it stops trying to read from Flash, so it's halted for a minute. And then Smart UART can go and write things into the instruction memory and to the data memory. Basically, it writes our binaries into these uh, tightly coupled memories. Um, read commands, what they do is they go and they ask you know, the uh, whatever we want to read. Let's say we want to read something that's in our instruction memory. We read from this memory mapped address. It goes into the smart UART. And the thing is that maybe the CPU sent something that's now stored in the FIFO. So instead, because we know that we initiated the command through the master, we have this bypass that will immediately go back into our computer. So how do we read and write um, things? Well, UART, it usually transmits eight bits and they usually represent ASCII characters. But ASCII actually only uses 128 uh, characters, so it only uses 7 bits. So bit 7, the MSB, is unused. And we use this to um, signal transactions. So we use it as an escape character. And then we uh, have this Python interface that takes anything with, uh, you know, any like read or write command that we write and translates it into escape characters that are then um, taken by the smart UART controller and understood as what they're supposed to do inside the SOC. So I told you a whole bunch about all these types of things like bootstraps and what, what happens at reset and smart UART and so forth and so on. Why did we go through all of this? Well, it's because our chips just arrived and we now need to do something with them. So what do we do? We start by setting up our voltages, we connect the power supply and configure the low dropout um, uh, uh, converters. Okay, so we have our input voltage over here, which actually comes from that FTDI chip from the USB-C, and it's 3.3 volts, but we need a lower voltage on uh, going to the board, or many lower voltages. So that type of thing goes into these um, LDO chips, and the LDO chips, according to uh, kind of a uh, ladder of, um, of uh, resistors over here, it's going to put, put out some sort of a voltage on the output that's going to go to the chip. And so you can see these things over here. We have these variable resistors, which we can see over here, those are the blue things. We have a little screw over here where we can change the actual voltage over here and measure it. Um, where do we measure it? Well, we have these different points over here where we can connect uh, measurement equipment and see what our voltage is that's actually going to the chip. There's another point over here about these, uh, about these little pictures over here, and I just wanted to point it out. We have a very small resistor that's in series with the, uh, with the voltage connection to the chip. Now, why do we have that? Well, first of all, there's a jumper over here, so we can bypass it and then short circuit just the, um, the voltage over here. What we can do is we can pull out this jumper and connect to this point and therefore put in an external supply bypassing the LDOs. But what we can also do is um, connect a voltage, uh, a, a voltage measurement uh, equipment over here and see what the voltage that falls on this little resistor is. And knowing the, re the resistance, which is very small, and the voltage that falls on it, we can actually measure the current that goes into the chip, and that's really useful for power measurements. So I just wanted to show you that part. Okay, and this is where the U USB C connects and uh, provides the FTDI chip over here. And that's all we need to really communicate with our chip and provide the voltages. So now what do we do? We're going to run a program. But it doesn't work. It unfortunately never, got, uh, never does. So really, we need to start debugging. And thank God that we have our smart UART.